Here you can see Enron's earnings are increasing quite healthily until the third quarter of 2001. That was the reporting in October 2001 over those where they reported a big loss. What happened was that Enron was that the Raptors, they, Enron kept shifting more and more money losing assets to the Raptors to hide their losses and their debts, which, and they didn't have to, these are called the Raptors, and they didn't have to consolidate the Raptors. So therefore they could completely ignore all of these losses. But eventually what happened was the Raptors were losing so much money that the bank was calling back its debt. So the bank went back to Enron saying, hey, you have a guarantee, it's time to pay up. And then Enron had to pay out the money, in which case it had to start recording all these losses. So here you can see how Enron's, um, this was Raptor's income, and this is Raptor's impact on earnings. So initially, um, Rap the Raptors were helping earnings and they there was a mess up in the fourth quarter of 2000 and enron covered for that by creating more of these spes and that pretty much covered up the problem but by the third quarter of 2001 enron stocks started to drop and they were running out of ways to cover their guarantees and the entire thing unraveled until they came up with a billion dollars in losses so this is just one example. There's a lot more of these, and um, it was truly a fiasco. So as a result of this, the FASB looked at their SPE problem, and they came up with something new called VIEs, variable interest entities. So they said that variable interest entities include not only special purpose entities, but also certain other entities. Now. In order for me to go through this, I have to warn you in advance that I could teach a whole class on variable interest entities. The accounting for them is extremely convoluted and bizarre. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go through the basics so you can understand how their account, why there's a problem here. And I get a general idea about the principles behind variable interest accounting. So a VIE is a legal structure used for business purposes. It could be a corporation, a trust, a partnership that doesn't have equity investors with voting rights and shares in all the entities, profit and losses, or it has equity investors that do not provide sufficient financial resources to support the entity's activities. In other words, there's a dis in a normal company, when there's profits, they go to the stockholders. And the larger percentage of stock you own, the greater your profits or your losses, right? And there's a direct relationship between the stock you own and the profits and losses. When it comes to a variable interest entity, profits and losses don't necessarily match equity interests. In other words, you might have all the stock, but the VIE is structured in such a way that you're not entitled to all the profits. Or you might be entitled to the profits, but not the losses. Because you get 100% of the profits, but you don't have to have any of the losses at all. That'd be a variable interest entity because the profits and losses of the entity don't quite match what belongs to the stockholders. And that's what, at its heart, a variable interest entity. And somehow, the profits and losses go somewhere else. Now, understandably, sometimes profits and losses do go someplace else. You could have a profit sharing plan, right? So even though you're a stockholder, 10% of the profits might go to the profit sharing plan and not to you. Um, there are other examples like that, but variable interest entities are more extreme in that you might be the stockholder and hold 100% of the stock, but you're entitled to a 5%, you're guaranteed a 5% return on investment every year. That's it. It doesn't matter how profitable they are, how unprofitable they are, you are entitled to 5% each. So there, there's no connection between your ownership in the variable interest entity and the actual profits. And what you would say is that, well, you're not really the owner. Now, let me give you an example so you can understand. This is an example in the book, which I, I really like. Um, this is similar to the example before that I was saying, where you transfer an asset over and then you lease it back. 
So in this situation, ABC company is going to do a sale lease back. And the SPE or the variable interest entity is leasing corp. So actually they're doing it a little differently here. It's not a sale lease back. It's just a lease agreement. So the owner of the building is going to sell the building to lease corp and lease corp is going to pay them $100,000. Now, where did Lease Corp get $100,000 from? They borrowed 85,000 senior debt, 12,000 junior debt, and an eensy, teensy, teensy little investor invested $3,000. And now, ABC Corp gets to use the building in exchange for lease payments. Now, so this would be a variable. I'll explain why this is a variable interest entity in a moment. But if you notice, the one thing that's a little suspicious about this is that the investor has invested very little money. And if there was a problem with the building, let's say ABC Corp stopped paying the lease, then chances are the investor would not have enough money invested in leasing Corp in order to pay off the debt to keep making payments. So typically, ABC Corp would need to consolidate Leasing Corp if they owned enough stock, a controlling interest, right? But here, ABC doesn't have any interest at all, doesn't have any ownership in Leasing Corp. None whatsoever, and therefore they don't need to consolidate. So you could, if you wanted to buy a building, instead of capitalizing the building and recording $97,000 in debt and investing $3,000 of your own money, you can structure it this way. And this way, you don't have to put the building on your books, but better yet, you don't have to put $97,000 worth of debt on your books either. And this would be a perfectly legitimate transaction to do that if it weren't for a few little problems. So, Normally, if ABC owned Leasing Corp, it wouldn't be a question. You consolidate, and that would eliminate the problem. When you consolidate, then ABC Corp has to put $97,000 onto its books as a debt. But we don't want to do that, right? So let's say the investor just happens to be the owner of ABC Corp. Or let's say the investor is the owners of ABC Corp's roommate. Okay, so investor is roommate. And we'll call ABC is owned by, I don't know, Alfred B. Cohen. <laughs> there you go, Alfred B. Cohen. So Alfred's roommate is the investor. That's a good deal. and. Alfred says to the investor, invest $3,000 and I guarantee you, gives, maybe he loans him the $3,000 on the side, right? And he says to him, I guarantee you that the building will be worth more than X number of dollars. So you got a return on your investment and I'll give you everything above that as a profit or everything above $100,000 is a profit. Now, that's where you get into problems because then maybe ABC really does own Leasing Corp. But they don't, they don't own any stock. Investor owns the stock. And Enron set up all sorts of transactions that are like this, but there was always a little catch and some way that Enron was gonna be on the hook. And what ultimately, got to Enron was that there were so many catches they all came at once and it was like a giant you know avalanche of different things happening that snowballed I'm sorry mixed metaphor it was it was a giant you know avalanche and everything just fell apart completely at once and all of a sudden they were on the hook for so much money that they didn't know where it was ever going to come from so here's the deal by the VIEs when you have a VIE, you need to identify what's called the primary beneficiary. 
and the primary beneficiary has to consolidate the VIE. Now, who's the primary beneficiary? Again, how I'm going through this, this is very, very general. Um, if you do this in the real world, then you need to read the rules. The rules are very complicated, and this is not meant to cover all the rules. It's just give you an understanding of how variable interest, what, they, what variable interest entities are and how they work. The primary beneficiary is deemed to have the controlling financial interest, even though they don't own the stock. So what they do is they have the ability to direct the activities of the VIE, or they absorb the losses, or they receive the benefits. So whoever's really entitled to the profits, or whoever really has to absorb the losses in the end, or whoever runs the VIE, is really the primary beneficiary. So if ABC Corp said to the investor, you're entitled, I guarantee you, the residual above, value above $100,000, then ABC is, then a, the investor is really an investor. Right? But if ABC gets the gain, like it says down here, if ABC guarantees the value of the building, I'm sorry, I said it kind of wrong. ABC guarantees the value of the building, then if there's a loss, ABC has to cover it. That means ABC is at risk and ABC is the primary beneficiary. If ABC is entitled to all the value of the building above $100,000 when it's sold, then again, ABC gets the profits, even though there's an investor, and ABC is deemed to really be the owner because they're the primary beneficiary and they have ABC has to consolidate. So common stock, normal common stock is usually a variable interest by definition. But if there are other protections, it says toss protection, I should say loss protection, okay? If there's loss protection on common stock, then the common stock might not be the variable interest. It might be whoever is protecting the loss. Senior debt is almost never variable interest. Subordinated debt might be, and loaner asset guarantees may indicate that a variable interest entity exists. So here are some of the things that you may indicate a red flag, that you have a VIE, various contracts, what's called a subordinated loan. Because the thing about a subordinated loan is that it's not going to pay if there's already too much too many primary loans equity interests in a vie 50 percent or less um oftentimes they are the real primary beneficiaries guarantors are primary often get primary beneficiaries whether they're guaranteeing debt of this spe or they're guaranteeing asset recovery values Put options in forward contracts may also indicate the existence of SPEs. So SPEs create all kinds of complexities for companies. And what we have to be aware of is that financial statements should reflect reality. So when we prepare financial statements, things like variable interest entities, special purpose entities, undermine the reliability of financial statements because they hide debt and they hide losses. And so you have to be very careful in the presence of these types of transactions to make sure that they're accounted for properly. Honestly, the FASB rules are very, very complicated for these and they are in a way incomplete because the people who are creating these transactions are paid a lot more money and they have a lot more time on their hands than the FASB members and their staff. So they will always be ahead of the FASB and they will always be able to come up with things that the FASB wasn't quite ready for. And the FASB may play catch up, but your responsibility as an accountant is to identify these transactions and make sure that even if they don't meet the letter of the law and the FASB rules don't require that you consolidate them. 
if in fact they represent the types of risks that the FASB that should be reported to investors, then they need to be reported. And they may need to be consolidated and oftentimes they need and they may need to be disclosed. So variable interest entities, interest entities and special purpose entities. And remember that your grandmother may be investing in this company.